Uh, Jared Spool has been here actually before and done uh, keynotes uh, three, four years ago, I believe, and he's back this year. And we're really excited to have him um, kick off this uh, conference, given the financial issues that we're all going through. Um, Jared's going to talk about cooking up gourmet user experiences on a fast food budget. So we thought it was a very appropriate way to start the, uh, the conference, and so let's give a big hand to Jared School. Oregon, no? How did you avoid this? 
Burgerville. No, 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 no. It's not in that. People don't travel for 3,000 miles to go to Burgerville. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to Burgerville. It's not, a, it's good, it's good. It's like five guys in Washington. It's not in that. Okay. But you have five guys too? Okay. So you're almost there. Someday you'll get in and out and you'll join the real world. Hey, we don't have in and out in Boston, nor do we have five guys. We, 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 we don't actually have good burgers in Boston. But, so the deal here is, is, that, is that what really is, is intriguing about in and out is just how they've been able to sort of elevate this idea of fast food to something that people really crave. And I'm guessing Burgerville has done the same here and five guys has done the same where they are. But that's the idea, right? Sort of. It, it's those four elements that we just talked about. It's, it's the meticulous preparation and having quality ingredients and focusing on uh, uh, making it just right. And, and that's uh, uh, sending sort of shockwaves throughout the entire fast food industry as people are trying to understand what that could take. So now how do we apply this to, to web design? After all, that's what we're, we're here to talk about. And I think we just sort of have to sort of take these things apart and look at the individual pieces and see how we get to that point. So let's start with this idea of meticulous preparation and, and what that actually means. And uh, to do that, at User Interface Engineering, the company I work for, we are, we're a research company. We study how people do things. And one of the questions we've had on our research agenda for a really long time is how do the best teams create great design? You can take designs and you can put them on a scale. And on one side of the scale, you would put designs that delight people, that people love to use, that people really interact with. I'm sure there are all sorts of things in your life that you are just proud to own, that you are happy to have, that you are really uh, uh, um, uh, pleased that you've made that investment. And then there's, on the other side, there are things that frustrate, things that really make life difficult. And teams created each of these things. And I can tell you that the teams that created the ones that were frustrating didn't have different goals than the teams who created the ones that were great. Right? They didn't wake up and say, yeah, we're never going to do something great, so let's see how much we can frustrate our users. <laughs> they don't say that, right? Everybody, every team we've ever talked to, the ones who, who have produced great stuff and the ones who struggled to produce great stuff, everybody has the same objective. They all want to produce great stuff. So then what is it that prevents people from producing? producing great stuff. And to look at this problem, we, we started to look at how people get things done. How do you actually produce a design? And so we came up with this spectrum. And in the middle of the spectrum is this notion of a process. Process turns out to be key. Now, our definition of a process is it's a series of steps that you use to get something done. Okay. That's all it is, a series of steps you use to get something done. And when we talk to teams about their process, they often say, you know, that's our problem. We don't have a process. But it turns out that's not true. Because if they've gotten something done, and practically every team at some point gets something done, if they've gotten something done, they had a process. You had to have the steps to get it. My mother, um, one of the reasons I know Julia Childs is because my mother was a master chef. And they used to hang. One day I came home, and, and Julia and my mother were in the kitchen completely tanked. <laughs> They've been hitting the sherry. It was really sort of funny. Um, but the, 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 my mother's an amazing chef, and, and there are all these foods that I grew up with uh, that, that I've always wanted uh, to know how to make. Uh, one of them was, is, is chicken paprikash. And it, uh, it, it's peasant food as far as my mother's concerned. It's not something she, had, she, she learned it from her mother who learned it from her mother. It's, it's just something that's been passed down through the years. And I've asked my mother for the recipe for chicken paprikash, and she's told me such things do not exist, that her chicken paprikash has no recipe. She has no process. But I can tell you that she does because she makes these meals, right? And if I were to stand next to her as she cooked chicken paprikash, and I were to write down everything she put in, every step she did, I'd end up with a recipe. I'd end up with the process. Right? So when teams insist they don't have a process, they really do. They're just not paying attention to their process. And 
That's okay if it works out for them, but it's not okay if it's not working out for them because how do you do something better if you're not paying attention? So that's what a process is. Now it turns out on this spectrum, to one side of it, there's what we call methodologies. And me what methodologies are is they're formalized processes. What we try and do is we say, hey, that worked. Let's see if we can do that again. Let's see if we can figure out how to do it over and over and over again because it works. And that's what methodologies are. And methodologies, there's a whole slew of them. They, they, they go from unstructured, just repeating what you did before, to very formal uh, structures where you document everything and you put it in its own notebook and you give it its own name and you create a consulting organization around it. And uh, methodologies uh, are sort of the bread and butter of, of how we think about how we get stuff done. And a lot of our conversations uh, when we talk about Agile and when we talk about object-oriented stuff and all this stuff uh, uh, is basically methodologies and sometimes it gets so extreme it actually hits uh, this extreme point on the spectrum which I call dogma. Dogma is mm, actually the best way to explain dogma is to show you one. So I'm going to show you a dogma. And the best place to look for a dogma today is at the Transportation Security Administration. That's where dogma is, is just manifest. And what's amazing about the Transportation Pyramid Security Administration, and by the way, it's TSA, a lot of people actually don't know that's what it stands for. Some people think it stands for a thousand standing around. <laughs> sort of looks like this, which seems safe uh, 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 for, because all these people are suspected terrorists, so it's good to get them all in one place. The, you know that, right? Before you go through security, every single one of you is a suspected terrorist. That's why they're putting you through security. So. Uh, uh, and, and they have yet to find the proof about me. They have a program called 311. Um, if you've traveled, you must be aware of this. Basically, it says you can only take things that are three ounces or less, and you have to stick uh, them in a uh, single Ziploc bag, and you can only take one bag through security. And the way this process works is, the point behind it is that any liquid that's in a container that is more than three ounces is potentially a suspicious substance and therefore uh, shouldn't be allowed. It, 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 it could be an explosive and therefore it should be treated like a hazardous material and of course they take them and dispose of them safely out of harm's way of other people. <laughs> and, and the idea is to, to keep us safe. And, and I've learned some things, because I travel an awful lot, and I've learned a lot of things about traveling through security that a lot of people don't know. So for instance, uh, you may not know this, but cream cheese is not a suspicious liquid. It's not a liquid or a gel. Uh, 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 it, you can take as much cream cheese through security as you want. <laughs> Now, if you notice real quickly, this, this has the word real in quotes. I think that has an effect on it. <laughs> real cream cheese uh, is, is safe. Okay. However, uh, yogurt, you can't take yogurt through security. It's a gel. I don't know anyone who uses it like a gel. <laughs> but you cannot take it. So cream cheese is safe. Yogurt is bad. Green cheese is, is very safe, despite how gross it looks, and yogurt, no matter how cute it looks, is bad. And I tell you this because there was this, this one time I was going through security, and uh, uh, one of the things that I am very, very good at, uh, not just in airports, but pretty much anywhere, is noticing when there's a, a pretty woman in the room. And I noticed that there was one right in front of me in security. So she goes through the machine, and I'm as quickly as possible trying to go through the machine too, and, and I need to catch my flight, but I also wanted to see, never mind. Uh, so anyways, to my delight, as soon as I get through security, she's still waiting on the other side as soon as I get through the machine. Turns out uh, she's having a discussion with the security agent because she has brought with her a single tube of lotion. And this single tube of lotion is not in a Ziploc bag. And he is informing her that she will not be able to take this on board the airplane unless it's in a Ziploc bag. 
And she says, but I don't have a Ziploc bag. He says, well, you have to get a Ziploc bag. She says, well, where do I get a Ziploc bag? He says, well, we don't have any Ziploc bags. Well, then how am I going to get a Ziploc bag? He says, well, you can go out of security down to the other checkpoint, which is on the other side of the terminal, and you can get Ziploc bags there, and then you can come back through. She says, well, if I do that, I'm going to miss my flight. He says, well, I'm sorry. If you don't get a Ziploc bag, I can't let you take this lotion. So she turns to sort of the general public and just shouts to anybody who's within range, says, does anyone have a Ziploc bag? I do. <laughs> goes, oh, thank you. That's so nice. Thank you so much. So I proceed to take my Ziploc bag and remove all of the liquids that are in it. <laughs> and as soon as I do that, the security guard says, excuse me, what are you doing? Well, I'm taking all my stuff out of the Ziploc bag. He goes, you can't do that. He said, oh, no, I can't watch. I, I can't. <laughs> he said, no, no, no. He says, you have to have your liquids in the Ziploc bag. He said, well, no, 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 you don't understand. I've put mine through. We have already decided that it's not an instrument of terrorism. It is fine. It fit in the bag. We've proven it's under three ounces. It's fine. We're done. She can have my bag and do the same thing. He says, no, you can't. He says, why not? Well, 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 what about the checkpoints? The checkpoints? Yeah, get a spot check. What about the spot checks? I fly three times a week, every week. I've been in every airport in this country at some point over the last six months. I have never seen a spot check. So I'm wondering, what, what spot checks are we talking about? Well, there could be a spot check. And if there's a spot check, you have to have your liquids in the bag. You will not be allowed on the airplane without your liquids in the bag. This is dogma. You see, having liquids in the bag is safe. Having liquids outside the bag is not. And this is this is this is what happens here. I I think I figured this out. I've done some research. I've been talking to people in the federal government. I think the evidence that the former administration wants to make public of what we've learned from terrorism, the number one thing we learned from, from torturing terrorists is that terrorists can't open Ziploc bags. <laughs> That's the only explanation that we have discovered this flaw of terrorism, that they can't open Ziploc bags. And that's what keeps us safe. That, 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 that when it's in the Ziploc bag, it's safe. When it's not in the Ziploc bag, it's bad. And this is dogma. Dogma is a sort of unquestioned faith of anything, despite any evidence or logic that may surprise. Right? It, you, you cannot question this. The TSA people are the nicest people in the world until you start to ask them why we do the things we do when we go through security. Then it's dogma. And the reason this is interesting is because there's a lot of dogma that floats around the way we develop things. We get into our heads, this is the way things must be. We have to do things with standards, and we have to do things with uh, 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 Web 2.0, or whatever it is. We just, we just sort of pick these dogma, and then we just sort of try and, 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 and force it. And, and it, 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 becomes, it becomes this sort of real force behind what we're doing. And, and this was part of our question. When we were doing this research, when we were studying the organizations that did well versus the organizations that were having trouble, we, uh, we wanted to understand how much methodology and dogma played into this. And we had a hypothesis going into the study, which was if we found organizations that really consistently put out great experiences, that those organizations would uh, have some, found some secret methodology or they'd have some sort of dogma that they were following, that if we could learn what that was, we could do that too. And that's what we expected. But then we found that there were other things that were going on. As we did our research, we discovered that there was something on the other side of the process. We call that technique. Technique are the, the individual building blocks that go into process. So when we think about process, process is the series of steps we use to get something done. Technique are the individual parts of building blocks of each of those steps. And technique, uh, uh, you can think of as, uh, uh, well, you know, let's go back to cooking. For those of you who, who've never cooked, 
There is something that is that, that you have to do in many recipes called a roux. It's a very simple thing. By itself, it tastes like crap. Mm -hmm. right? If you ever eat roux, it's the most disgusting stuff. But it's in all really great foods. Great soups, great gravies, get great puddings, uh, 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 custards. Uh, roux are in, in lots of things. And what, what you do with a roux is you, uh, you take flour and oil, and you put it over low heat, and you stir it. And it's tricky to make. It's really tricky to make. Because if you, if you put the heat too high, it burns to the bottom of the pan. If you put it too low, it never quite congeals. It needs to have a certain consistency to work out great. Uh, uh, the first three or four times you make it, it comes out awful. And it just takes practice. And that's what it is. Techniques are things that you, 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 you just do, and you do them in all sorts of different things. They're not specific, right? You use a roux in, in Chinese cuisine, and in Mexican cuisine, and French cuisine, and basic good old American cooking. You know, turkey and gravy uses a roux. And, and, and so it's, it's sort of independent of the methodology, per se. It's independent of what we're, the end goal. It's just a technique that we use, and we have to be good at it. And the only way you get good at it is through practice, and maybe a little coaching. And that's, that's how you make a roux. So, so that's, that's a basic technique. And we have all sorts of basic techniques in what we do, in the process we do. And then there's this other thing on this, on this side of the spectrum, which I call tricks. Tricks are techniques that, um, that we do that aren't quite uh, the right way to do something, but they're effective. Recently, I had to hire a plumber. And it occurred to me as I was hiring the plumber that never once did I ask the plumber the methodology that they used. It never came up in conversation. I don't even know what a plumber would say if you asked them what methodology they use. Well, we used to use a waterfall methodology where we had all the flows and we tracked the inputs and the outputs and we looked at it. But we've been moving more towards an object-oriented methodology where we treat every drip as its own object and we just send it a message that says, fix yourself. <laughs> All I can tell you is this, right? Plumber pulls up in my driveway in his truck. I go out into the driveway to meet him. He opens up the back of the truck, and there's all this stuff in the back of the truck that looks like it had just come fresh from the Spanish Inquisition. And he takes a subset of the stuff out of the truck in this old toolbox that he has, and he brings it in the house. And he takes the, the, the uh, we go into the basement, and he looks at the dripping pipe, and he rummages around in the toolbox, and he grabs this wrench-like Thing, and he starts banging on the pipe. And I said to him, I said, how did you know you were going to need that tool? Because he hadn't seen the problem. He didn't know what it was. He looks at him, he says, well, I didn't really. Said, was that the right tool to be using? He goes, no. <laughs> well, why aren't we using the right tool? He says, I don't feel like going back out to the truck. <laughs> that's what a trick is, right? Sometimes it's actually easier to use the wrong tool to get the job done, than to go out to the truck and get the right tool and come back. Because you'll have it done by the time you get out there and find the tool and come back. It's just easier to use the wrong tool. And that's a trick. And it turns out that what we found in our research was that the best teams <coughs> didn't focus on methodologies and dogma. That they weren't fixated on certain ways to do things or capturing those methods and repeating them over and over again. But interestingly enough, the teams that were struggling, they did focus on those things. And every time they failed at completing one of their objectives, they focused on it even more. Oh, well, we, you know, if we stayed with the methodology, we would have done so much better next time. We're going to stay with the methodology. Instead, the best teams focused on techniques and tricks. They focused on working specifically with just having a big toolbox and knowing how to use all the tools, including knowing how to use them the right way and knowing how to use them the wrong way. And when they focused on having a rich toolbox that had every possible tool in it and then understanding when to use it and how to use it and how to get the most out of those tools, even in the wrong situations, they succeeded. That's what separated the best teams from the struggling teams. So lately we've been doing some work with the folks over at UPenn. And we've been, we've been talking about websites. And so, we, you know, of course, we start looking at, at websites. This is the home page for the UPenn website, which I have to tell you, we were pretty proud of the UPenn people for, uh, uh, 
for this particular design, primarily because it doesn't fall into the trap that university websites tend to fall into, which we call Girls Under Trees. This is uh, <laughs> University of Oregon, Iowa. And, and uh, on their home page, prominently future, featured is a wonderful uh, young woman named Samantha and her trees. This is UBC, uh, Girls Under Trees there. This is Imperial College of London. Uh, uh, we have University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, this is Reed College, that's local here, right? Uh, uh, University of Virginia. They have lots of girls under trees in Virginia. Um, uh, this is a university in Denmark. They have two girls at the university and they are both under trees. Uh, uh, this is in Brazil, this is University of Brazil. This is Singapore, uh, uh, this is Israel. Uh, Jerusalem, they don't have a lot of trees, so they have to conserve them. It's a desert after all. Uh, 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 in Hawaii, it's girls under palm trees, of course. Uh, and uh, the University of San Diego, it's guys with surfboards, which makes sense. The, the, uh, uh, this is actually because they have a physics class uh, of surfing. <laughs> the physics of surfing, and I'm sure that's everybody's thinking, yeah, we're going to learn physics. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so they, they, uh, um, they didn't fall into that trap, they were proud of it. But when you work on, on, on university websites, you, you, there's this elephant in the room that you're not allowed to talk about. And uh, the elephant in the room is this. Every part of the site is created by different people. Universities, <coughs> most universities, this, the individual pieces of the sites are owned by different parts of the university. And so they all look a little different. This is uh, the homepage, this is the School of Medicine, this is the nursing school, this is uh, student nurses, this is the admissions uh, school. And as you can see, they all are different. Uh, this is Wharton, this is the business school at, at University of Penn, and, and uh, it's got this cool little flash feature you can move around and it tells you little things about it. And, you, and of course you can click on it and see one of them. And, and, and what do we have here? Oh, girls under trees, okay. <laughs> they didn't fail us. We knew somewhere in the campus we'd have our, our girls under trees. Um, so how do we deal with the fact that every uh, every part of the university is putting out something that looks dramatically different, that no two parts look the same. Well, the knee-jerk reaction that everybody has is to use templates. Well, all we have to do is create a template, and everybody falls into the template, and you know, the first thing we're going to focus on the template is where the logo is and how big it is, and if, no, that's not big enough, that's and make it bigger green. And so, it's, you, you have this, this entire sort of uh, focus on templates. And everybody sort of gets behind the template idea. It's amazing how quick that idea gets adopted. It's like, it's just templates. Yeah, templates, that's great. If you give us templates, we'll be able to do this better. But there's a but. And it turns out, it's a big but. <laughs> In our research, of looking at this now for over 10 years, there is absolutely no evidence that templates ever work. There is no evidence that tells us that any institution that has tried to put out templates has actually gotten the results that they wanted, which is some sort of uniform, consistent design across the organization. It just doesn't work. Because it's not uh, uh, looking at the core problem. It doesn't work because it's basically an attempt at a methodology. It's, uh, and in some cases, templates become dogmatic. And it's just this, we have to do it. The problem with templates is that each page has its own purpose. The Student Association for Nursing is very different than the admissions process, which is very different than the page that's talking about you know, attracting uh, uh, high caliber graduate students for the business school. And those pages have to be designed to meet those needs. You have to start with the goals first. And the odds that they're going to end up looking the same is, is, is slim. But more importantly, it turns out that the only people who care whether the university website pages look the same are the people who 
Rodney University website communications program. That nobody else cares. No student is going to say, well, I love the programs that are here. I mean, the campus looks great, and, and I'm thinking that I'm going to learn a lot, but I'm not going to school because this page doesn't look like the previous page I was on. It doesn't happen. Instead, we have to have measures, and we have to look at what it is that we're trying to do. And so this comes down to, to building out the toolbox for tricks and techniques. And the toolbox for tricks and techniques is, is about understanding what to look at, what to, what to have. And as we've been doing our research, we've been finding that there are, in essence, uh, uh, three core attributes. We've, we've gone out, we've interviewed hundreds of teams. And we've collected all sorts of data about what makes a team succeed or not. And we've, we've put together these measures to say what is happening. We started with about 150 different variables. And we fed them into our statistical system. And we found that there are three variables, three attributes, that if a team exhibits these attributes, they're more likely to be in that successful group that I talked about than in the struggling group. So we can actually predict which groups they're going to end up in by just, act, by just looking at these variables. And we. We, the variables are uh, vision, feedback, and culture. And this becomes a great trick. We can ask some questions, and we can focus work around those questions. And we can get people to start focusing on some key elements with just some simple, simple uh, uh, key questions. So here's the three questions that we use. The first one is for vision. The vision question goes like this. Can everyone on your team describe what the experience of using your design will be like five years from now? Now, it, for a lot of people, that's just a, 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 a strange question. Right? Think about this. What's the experience of using design? Most people don't have an event horizon that goes past you know, the end of next month. So the idea of saying, well, what's this going to be like five years from now, is really, really hard. But a vision turns out to be absolutely key. It's the absolute key to success. You can think of a vision as a stake in the sand that's on the horizon. It's got a flag attached to it, and we can clearly see the flag. But it's so far away, there's no way we're going to get there today or tomorrow or any time in the near future. But because we can clearly see this flag, we can tell if any baby step we take gets us closer to that flag or farther away. We know instantly. We don't have to have a lot of bizarre metrics in place to, to figure this out. We can just look and see. That's what a vision is. Not only that, everybody else we're working with, no matter how close or far away from us, as long as they can see that flag, they can get to the same place too. So we can all start at different points and converge on the flag. And here's the other cool thing about a vision. A really good vision is actually stuck in the sand, which means we can pull it out of the sand and we can move it. And as long as we all can still see it and we know that it's moved, we just start moving towards it. It doesn't matter that it's changed. It can change a hundred times. We don't care because we're just, every step is going to get us closer. That's what a vision is. So what is the vision of the experience? Well, the experience is uh, uh, what is it like to use this design? What is it like to be a student, a high school student, thinking about college? What is it like to be someone who's fed up with their job and they think, well, if I get it, like a business degree or something, I could get a promotion. So we start with that experience and we say, what is, what is it like today to figure out what school we want to go to? And then we say, well, what could it be like if we got rid of all the frustrating bits that happen when you're trying to do that? What's the aspirational vision we're trying to build? So we work through it and we try and build out this vision. Feedback. So feedback question. The feedback question is, is also really interesting. In the last six weeks, have you spent more than two hours watching someone either use your design or a competitor's design? And this turns out to be really key. What we learned was that the organizations where people were spending significant time watching people use the designs that they produced, produced better designs. And it's not sort of a one-shot usability test. It's constant, 
all the time, every six weeks, having spent at least two hours. Everybody on the team should have spent at least two hours in the last six weeks watching people use the design. When you do that, and then you're in a meeting and you're talking about should we do it that way or should we do it this way, all of a sudden, that experience that happened sometime in the last six weeks will come up. Well, I, I, I watched you know, that person who was in on Wednesday, and there's no way she figured this thing out. We'd have to do it that way for her. All of a sudden, you've got real data. It's no longer opinion wars going back and forth. So this turns out to be key. And the last question has to do with culture. And this is a really wacky question. This really sort of gets people messed but it turns out that it, 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 it pretty much predicts the culture. In the last six weeks, has a senior member of your team rewarded anyone for a major design failure? Now, uh, I was sitting with a group of executives. We've been called into this, this company to uh, uh, help them dig out of their usability problem. Uh, usability problem was our competition is beating our asses on this thing by having better products than us. And so they were really frustrated. So I'm, I'm, this, is a, this is a billion dollar company. I'm sitting with senior vice presidents that half the people in the room report directly to the CEO. And they're here to talk to me. And I, and I talk about these three things and I bring up this question. And I said, and apparently, unbeknownst to me, the week before, the CEO had brought in the senior management team, brought up a screen, and started reaming them out about some design elements on the screen. And uh, so I asked this question. I said, Has, have you rewarded anyone for a major design failure? He says, well, reward is the word I use. <laughs> and that's just it, right? They were being condemned, punished, some negative thing because of they have messed up the failure design. But here's the deal. When we have a design failure, we learn something. It's not a pleasant way to learn, but it's in fact how people have learned for a million years. All the really important lessons we've learned in life, we have learned because we've screwed something up. There's an old saying, which is, good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgments. And so, we learn something. When a senior executive throws a party like Scott Cook does, the founder of Intuit, to reward people for some major design failure, people pay attention. Scott has made this, uh, uh, he's taken this, this lifesaver thing that they use on, on ships, and he's decorated it up. And he awards it every few weeks to someone who's really screwed up bad in the organization. It's a party for which they serve champagne and caviar. They make a big deal, they get a band, they do the whole thing. And there's a section where he makes a speech. The first three minutes of the speech is making fun of the person who screwed up. The next 20 minutes is going through all the lessons they learned and how important those lessons were to the organization. People want that lifesaver. It makes an organization take risks. Not uncontrolled, silly risks, managed risks. Organizations that are risk averse produce crap. So it turns out that this is an important question. And there are lots of little things you can do, lots of little stuff. This is the website, uh, this is part of the website for the American Red Cross. This is a, a, um, a page which has lots of uh, uh, information on it. It goes on for about 20, 800 by 600 screens. It tells you everything you need to know about donating to the American Red Cross. And most people know that you can donate blood. Some people know you can donate money. Some people, a few people know you can donate food or clothes. Most people don't know you can donate stock certificates. You can donate your house in an emergency. You can donate um, a car. There's all sorts of things they will take. There's about 40 things they will take. And as a result, most people don't know that because the page is designed such that it doesn't work. It doesn't tell you that. You don't realize that there's all these things you can do to donate to the Red Cross. And there's a way to find that problem out. It's a technique. It's, it, it, it's, it's a very simple technique called a five-second test. And you can do this on any page that is 
intended to communicate specific information. You don't want to do it on a home page because there's too many things a home page is trying to do. But you can do it on any of the leaf pages on your site. And it's so simple to do, we can do it right now. In fact, let's do that. If you have a piece of paper and a pen or you have your computer out, something to write on, you're going to need something to write on here. So, so now's the time to, to get that out. And what we're going to do is we're going to pretend you're in the market for a, a, a notebook computer. What most of us will call laptop computers, but the manufacturers can't call you that because then when you burn your laptop, they can sue them. Um, so they call it a notebook computer. So we're in the market looking for a notebook computer. We just had a computer. We loved the computer. The problem was it kept breaking down. And every time it broke down, the company that we bought it from would attempt to give us service, but their service was so bad, we never wanted to do business with them again. So we're off to find someone new to buy our computer from. And we found a company called CDW. And what we want to do is figure out if their service is going to help us. So I'm going to show you the page that you would click on when you click on the home page on the link that says technical support. So we're going to click on that page. I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show it to you for five seconds. So what I want you to do is to look at the screen for five seconds. Just study the screen. Five seconds. Is, is, is just a little longer than four seconds, so you'll have to be alert. And um, about a second longer, actually. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna do that, and then as soon as that's done, I want you to write down everything you remember about that page. So as soon as the page goes away, just remember that. So here we're gonna go, five seconds, it, it goes quickly. So on your mark, get set, go. I told you it was fast. Okay, write down everything you remember about that page. Now, what do you remember about the page? Just shout it out. How secure? Login. How secure? Login. How many people remember login? Oh yeah. Okay. So everybody remembers login. That was the prominent design element. That was the thing that came right out. We we saw that in five seconds. Uh, uh, so now, uh, write down on your piece of paper, uh, on a scale of one to five, where one is this is a business, a company you'd never want to do business with, and five is you think this is the company that's going to really help you with your support, write down where you would rate them, based on that page. Okay. How many people uh, uh, gave it a four or a five? Uh, there, there are 300 people, 400 people in the room. Nobody gave it a four or a five? Okay. Oh, you did. Okay, yeah, well, you're, you're, you're definitely several standard deviations off the meeting. <laughs> okay, let's try another page from this site. Turns out there's another page on the site that you get when you click on a link that's labeled customer service. So the last one was technical support. This one's labeled customer service. So now we're going to look at that page, five seconds. Uh, uh, again, it's going to go by quick, so here we go. Okay, write down everything you remember there. And again, on a scale of one to five, where one is uh, uh, you wouldn't want to do business with these guys, and a five is you know you definitely would do business where would you rate them based on that page. So what do you remember from that page? We're here to help. We're here to help. Chat. 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 Okay. Yeah. How many people gave that page a four or a five? Okay, decent number of you. We're going to look at one more page here. Um, uh, this is from a website called Crutchfield. They sell electronics too. And we're going to click on their link that says technical support. And we're just going to compare it to see what it's like. So again, five seconds, ready, go. So. Okay, write down everything you remember. And again, on a scale of one to five, give them a rating where one is you wouldn't want to do business with them, five is you definitely want to do business with them. Okay, what do you remember from that page? Free. Free, everything is free. How do they stay in business? I'll tell you, their prices are much higher than everybody else's. That's how they do free. Okay. So now, who, who gave it a four or a five? Oh, wow, practically half of you, okay. And just because we 
just because I'm a scientist, how many people hate raising their hands in little surveys? <laughs> That's our margin of error. So, <laughs> so this is a this is a very simple test. It's 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 absolutely trivial, and anybody can do it. And it turns out that it what, we did the whole thing in under five minutes. So that's why it's called a five-second test, because you can do it in under five minutes. And the, the key thing is, is that you can do this you know, in the company cafeteria. You can go to Starbucks, and you can show people paper screens. You just you know, flip over the page for five seconds, flip it back. OK, what do you remember from that? Right? You can do all these experiments. It's just a simple technique. And it tells you a tremendous amount about how people see the page. And from this, we could go back and we could change the American Red Cross page until people tell us about all the different things we could donate. And then we're done. It's a very simple way to figure out what's working and what isn't. And that's the type of feedback that I'm talking about. And learning from those mistakes is what I'm talking about. And having the vision that says, we want people to understand is what I'm talking about. Another technique, very simple, paper prototype. If you've never done this before, it's, it's like the most amazing thing. You should plan to do it on at least one project in the next five months. It will change the way you think about design. You do this at the very beginning of design, when you're just coming up with the idea. You, you, take, you take what you want, you build it out. Karen Snyder, by the way, has written a fabulous book on this. Uh, uh, she's not very imaginative, so she just called it paper prototyping. Uh, but, it's, but it's an excellent book inside. Despite the sort of boring title, um, and I highly recommend it. Uh, but it's very simple. You just take the elements that you're designing out, and you just write them down. And, and you can do all sorts of cool things. You can uh, we use uh, uh, transparency tape or transparency screens. We cut them up, and then we take transparency pens. You can create an entire checkout process. As someone's walking through your site and they're putting things in the cart, you can actually create the screens and have them use it. And the thing is, is that you can do this and just hours after you come up with the design idea. And it might not be the right design idea, but you'll learn that almost instantly. You'll get feedback right away. And you'll learn from design mistakes before you put the effort in coding and before you, you built it out. And it turns out to be a fabulous, fabulous trick. And these sorts of things can be very helpful. So, so that's about preparing. That's, you know, that's sort of this notion of, of, of meticulous preparation. But we also need great ingredients. We need to understand what that's going on. And over at In-N-Out, it's really fascinating what they've done. The In-N-Out menu is incredibly simple. They sell burgers, they sell fries, they sell shakes, and soda. And that's it. Now, there is a secret menu. If you ever go to In-N-Out, before you go, you should look up the secret menu on, you just, you just Google the In-N-Out uh, secret menu, and it will tell you about all sorts of different things you can order. But they're all basically burgers and fries and shakes. That's all they make. And the thing is, if you stand in and out and you watch them, you, you right behind the register, there's a big uh, 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 sink that has this device on it, and they're putting fresh potatoes in, and they're, they're actually chopping up the potatoes. And the fries you're having have been cut from fresh potatoes just minutes before you have them. And they have their own butcher on site, and they actually, the meat is so fresh, it, it comes, you know, it basically walks in the back door. And, and it is uh, um, really just a, a, a stunning operation. Because they've kept it simple, they've been able to do great things. And, and that turns out to be really key. We try and do too much sometimes. We're involved in a project with the Massachusetts General Hospital that involves uh, communities for uh, people who suffer from neurologic illnesses. And when we first started working with this community years ago, we, we discovered that, that, that this was a, a really quite remarkable thing. There were, there's a website called braintalk.org where uh, hundreds of thousands of people visit every day dealing with neurological uh, uh, issues, all sorts of, of neurological chronic illness. Uh, there's Parkinson's forums and multiple sclerosis and, and all sorts of stuff. And, and at any given day, uh, uh, they get hundreds of questions from people, and, and people respond to them. And this is like one of the questions that, that, that uh, somebody got. This is from a 25-year-old a, a woman who 
is thinking she might have MS, and she's really, really scared, and she doesn't know what to do about it. And this is the type of thing that, that people are, are trying to help with. They're you know, trying to explain what's going on with their lives. And, and it's really hard. Well, we, we did a project where we were uh, going through the messages, and we were classifying them to see what types of questions people were asking. And it was really hard. We, could only, we actually had to limit the researchers to only working on the project for two hours a day because it was emotionally draining. It just, just reading these messages was just really, really difficult. But there was something that, that sort of we noticed. And the first time, the first, we went through, through thousands of messages. And there, there would be these serious questions. And then all of a sudden, there would be this thing that says, hey, everybody, I turned 42 today. And all of a sudden, within, if you look at the timestamps, within about five minutes, two or 300 people would have wished this person a happy birthday. And it wasn't just a sort of happy birthday. It was people were writing poems, people were singing, people were doing all sorts of amazing sort of things. And they, uh, uh, and they were really getting into wishing this person a happy birthday. And then an hour later, it would happen again. Someone would say that it was their birthday too. And 200 people would respond. And this happened every hour of every day. Somebody would declare it's their birthday and somebody would uh, respond. And at first, we just we, we actually threw this data out because it wasn't a question and we were looking at questions and we didn't know how to deal with it, but it kept coming up and it kept showing up and we were trying to figure out what this meant. And it occurred to us that there is something really fundamental happening here, something really important. 